I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of The Wall Street Journal, continues with me, and we're joined by our friend and colleague, Patrick Travonic, who finally comes home to us. Mary and I have watched him travel uh, through his Twitter feed around the world. And Mary, you want to say a special word about Patrick's work for June 4th. What is June 4th, and what did Patrick do for all of us? So on the anniversary, an important anniversary of uh, Tiananmen Square, the 25th anniversary, Patrick tweeted as if he were reliving it. So every hour, he tweeted photographs, accounts, um, missives. Uh, It it was an absolutely eye-opening tweet session. John, I think it's the most powerful thing I have ever experienced on Twitter. Black and white photographs and color photographs. Starting, what would you start on June 3rd? Um, actually started on uh, April 15th. Oh, which you is started when the that protest far back. began. I see. I see. And, and it kind of slowly grew. And it just began as a personal project. And I discovered uh, all kinds of photos and started started figuring out for myself where exactly they fit in the story. And, and uh, of course, it intensified as, as, the, as things reached their climax. There were faces in the crowd. Do we know who those people are today, where they are, the the students who were gathering out thinking this was a profound change and were not covering their faces or trying to... Or the to tank man, do we know where he is? Uh, well, we don't know where he is, uh, but some people actually reached out to me on Twitter or by email and said, that's me. Wow. Uh, or, uh, or, or related uh, their experiences that day and seeing the same things that I was tweeting about. The one I have up in front of me is June 4th, 1989, 12 a.m., which is just turning, just turning to the day that we celebrate. So this is uh, turning it over. Along West Chang'an Avenue, buses are turned into ambulances to ferry wounded to hospitals. Where did you get this picture, Patrick? Has it just been hanging around in your collection? (laughs) Uh, I scoured the web. And, of course, Twitter is not a very good uh, place for giving credit where credit's due. Um, so I couldn't really say all the different places that I got things from. But, uh, but uh, look, I only tweeted photos that I could, with a reasonable amount of accuracy, place in a specific place and time. I, there were lots that I didn't tweet because I, I didn't know exactly where they came from or, where, or when they were taking but place. Patrick, it really illustrates that it was a massacre. It wasn't an incident. It wasn't a small thing. It was a massacre, and it wasn't just in Beijing. It w- th- that's one thing that I tried to go out of my way to, to emphasize, that there was uh, incidents of unrest uh, throughout China, uh, many cities. And, and for me, you know, I used to live in China. I used to live in Beijing. And I drove past some of these places, uh, not really even realizing at times what had taken place there. So this was a, a kind of a voyage of personal discovery for me. I'm told, Mary, you've lived six years in Hong Kong for the Asia Wall Street Journal. I'm told that now that we're 25 years later, the passion and the focus and the memories are getting stronger and that the interest is more ferocious, though we're ne- now dealing with younger people who, who couldn't have been there. Right, and, and that's, I think, been a surprise to the Communist Party in Beijing who expected when the leaders of the democracy movement retired uh, and some of the religious leaders, uh, for example, of the Catholic Church, Cardinal Zen, stepped down, that it would all just go away and uh, Hong Kong would happily become another Chinese city. But what we've seen in in recent days, this is very recent, there's been an online petition to ask Hong Kongers about their support for democracy, and you've had this enormous su- support online, almost immediate, almost a million people in a city of seven to eight million in just the first couple of days saying that they want real democracy. So it's going to be very interesting to observe how China deals uh, with this territory that has become very used to having Western-style freedom, well, universal freedom, shall I say. And, and you know, it's it's highly relevant today. Um, it may seem, 25 years ago, it may seem a long time ago, but the past is prologue. And and I think that while while China has moved on in many ways, in some ways it hasn't moved on. And a lot of the issues about how China copes with corruption or through, or inflation or a slowing economy, uh, what kind of political reforms are possible, press freedom, a lot of things that are current today and being discussed both inside the Communist Party and outside of it are 
constrained in many ways by what happened in 1989. But Patrick, were you surprised when you had mainlanders write to you? I mean, uh, we read all these stories today of these young people in China who have been absolutely brainwashed. They have no idea that June 4th ever happened. Or if they do, they're uncomfortable talking about it because they know that nothing good comes from talking Mm. about it. Travels with Patrick. All right. From 1989, we go to 2014. We'll quickly touch on your visit to Kazakhstan, large Central Asian republic, former part of the Soviet client states, now cut free, sort of ruled by the same family that it was during the Soviet era and its apparatchiks, a great deal of energy, not so many people, uh, with prospects to become an energy superstar, part of the Russian Federation. Uh, ability to sell to both Europe and to China at the same time. What did you learn in Kazakhstan? Why were you there? Well, I was there to attend the Asia Development Bank annual meeting. And uh, and it was, I think it was an experience for a lot of people uh, throughout Asia to go to Kazakhstan. A lot of them... Were you in Almaty? Where were you? Uh, I, I was in Astana, which is the capital that they built the kind capital. of out of nothing, uh, which is... Uh, all that you could imagine, you know, uh, uh, cutting edge, uh, very expensive architecture uh, in the middle of the plains uh, with not a lot of people. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's it, a lot of it financed from the Middle East. Uh, the same money that financed Dubai financed a Astana, building of Astana. They actually have the highest NPL ratio, non performing loan ratio in the world. I think it's something above 30%. Uh, <laughs> so a kind of mix of the good and the bad, but it, they do, you know, they, they have a lot of resources there. In fact, they have this. Uh, um, they have one, particularly in the uh, in, in the Caspian Sea offshore. They have a, a major oil field that could rival anything in um, in Saudi Arabia if they can get it up and going. And they have had a lot of trouble because of uh, the sulfur gas that's in there, and and and. Uh, both can, is, can contaminate the, uh, the the workplace and is also a great danger and, and, and it corrodes the pipes and they've had a lot of trouble um, and uh, and also you know they're they're landbound right so they don't have they don't have any port to ship it from so it's either got to go out through Russia or through China now of course China is eager to get as much as as much energy as they can um, from overland, particularly because that you know it's not exposed to the U.S. Navy, so so they they're they're very keen on that relationship. But so there's a lot of a lot of promise, a lot of potential, but a lot of challenges. Patrick, I was in Kazakhstan in 1998, and it was still kind of the Soviet period, and there were a lot of young men who were standing around and <laughs> not really doing very much. And did you see that? there now has anything I didn't really see it changed? In, I didn't see it in Astana because Astana is the capital and the only reason why people are there is because they're like they work for the government um, but you know maybe if I had gone to Almaty I may have seen more of that. Almaty is the old capital about a hundred miles from China's border is That's my right. memory of it and there are beautiful mountains behind it. We've all Gorgeous. been to Almaty. The people are also extremely attractive, a mix from European and Asian. The younger people because the Russians migrated or emigrated or were forced. This is Gulag Central here in Kazakhstan and the apparatchiks running it, the oligarchs running it when I was there, what is this now, ten years ago, uh, were what were you Brutal, doing in Kazakhstan br- 10 years ago, John? <laughs> uh, the same what? Business, what? The We've same, all been there? That, we, this we is all very work, strange. We all work for the alphabet agencies <laughs> and we pretend to be on air giving out <laughs> oh, information. No. We have to <laughs> understand. Jeez. No, Almaty is a place that you run into your friends, isn't it, Mary? I mean, Okay, <laughs> friends with machine guns. <laughs> yes. Uh, but what I saw was that there had been no change in governance from the Soviet era 10 years ago. How about today? Well, it's. I guess you could call it a benign dictatorship in the sense that, that uh, you know, there has been a lot of economic development, but it's a dictatorship. And, uh, um, you know, one of the things that, that Nazarbayev, who's the, the president for life... And the family of And, and his extended family. One of the, th- one of the, but one of the things, he's, he's a very clever man in the sense that he has been able to maintain independence by maintaining a good relationship with Russia, a good relationship with China, and a good relationship with the United States, a very positive relationship with the United States. So... 
you know, maybe it's the best that you can hope for in a region that doesn't have much of a history of democracy, but but you wouldn't want to get on his bad side. We must touch Australia before we turn back to Europe. Uh, your travels with Australia, Mary's keen on it. She travels there much. People listen to her very closely. We want to be positive about this, but you say that the Australian resources of producers are concerned about China. How so? Well, the reason I get invited to Australia a lot is because... Uh, you know, I, I was until a year ago based out of China, and China is really the key driver for, uh, for the commodity boom, the the minerals boom that that has uh, driven Australia's economy. Uh, Australia is called the lucky country; they haven't had a recession in oh, I don't know how long, past twenty, thirty years. Um, but they're all a bit concerned about this slowdown in China and and what it portends, and whether they'll be able to maintain. Uh, you know the the exports of iron ore and other sorts of things that that they've uh, been feeding China with. Patrick, they seem to have a problem attracting investment because they're so high cost. You had the whole auto industry basically evaporate in Australia, and now they're moving to try to roll back this minerals tax to sort of you know attract more investment into natural resources. Is that going to work, Patrick? Well, it's you know it's the Dutch disease, which is that you know when you have a, a, a raw materials boom. Uh, you export that and then it bids up the price of your currency and it makes everything else in the economy more expensive and it sort of squeezes those things out and of course raw materials go through booms and busts and then when you're left with the bust you you don't have those sustainable industries to, to, but didn't that they are competitive bring this, didn't globally. they bring this on themselves I mean they, their high cost doesn't only come from the fact that they have resources they did this to themselves didn't well, they well they they I think, you know, the danger is always when you treat the boom as though it will last forever and it's just, you know, the going into the foreseeable future. And, and you've got to make provision for when you, you, when the when you reach the, so next, the next part of that cycle, you've got to be prepared for it. Patrick Chavonik, uh, who is Chief Strategist, Silvercrest Asset Management. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. And we're going to leave Asia and travel to a surprising place, the Panama Canal Zone. Patrick's travels there reveal the future for energy in North America, in the New World. And then we'll touch on Brussels and a glimpse of the European economy in recovery, question mark. I'm John Batchelor.